Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. My name's Will, you're watching Ball Pipe and Breeder UK. In today's video we're going to talk about ball pipe and humidity, how to maintain it and why it's important for their health. So instead of just telling you what humidity you need, I'm going to go a bit more in depth and give you some of the logic behind it. So before I go too far into the topic, I just want to let you know in case you're wondering what morph this is. This is a Coral Glow Leopard Pastel Clown. This is a female I'm growing on, and I'm hoping she'll be ready to breed in around 12 months. So she's going to, hopefully she's going to sit still, but we'll find out anyway. So the, the kind of best, say it loosely, but kind of the best uh, humidity range for ball pythons is about 65%, I'd say, is what I aim for. As low as 55% can be okay-ish, but really what you want is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent it can go a little bit higher than 70 percent it's not great to have it you know prolonged periods of high high humidity um, but within the 60 to 70 percent range you're going to have a, a snake that sheds well um, is comfortable is able to relax and probably feeds better as well so what i kind of want to say about humidity is that um, I guess we're all aware of, of how dangerous, uh, you know, exceptionally high temperatures are or exceptionally low temperatures, because we know, sorry, she's getting out of control. Uh, we know that, you know, temperature can kill your snake quite quickly. But what I want to kind of explain is that actually humidity can kill your snake too. And if it's humidity that ruins your snake's health, it's going to be a slower process with a lot more suffering. So it really is important, it's really important to keep them shedding, keep their humidity high. Well, as high as I say, not as high as some species. And the reason for this is that, I mean, the most obvious reason is, of course, that if they have humidity that's too low, they don't shed properly. They get things like stuck shed, stuck eye caps, um, conditions that, which can lead to, well, eventually kind of infections of the eyes and even blindness, actually. Um, you know, stuck shed, if it goes on for several sheds in a row, can be quite a big deal. It can be hard to deal with. I'll do a separate video on shedding soon. Um, and that's kind of like the main thing we know about. And then the second, well, the second thing, well, one of many things <laughs> we also mention in connection with humidity is, of course, um, scale rot. And scale rot is something that a lot of people will tell you comes from high humidity. It actually doesn't really just come from high humidity, it comes from high humidity and very poor hygiene for a long period of time. So if your snake is is filthy um, and you keep it in very high humidity for a long time, or if you keep it in, for example, a bioactive enclosure and you never change the substrate or never spot clean, um, then you, you probably will get scale rot. I know that really offends um, some people when I mention the bioactive setups, but since bioactive setups have been on the scene, I've seen more cases of scale rot coming up than I did in the previous, you know, 10, 15 years before that. Remembering that in terms of ball piping keeping, I'm a dinosaur because I've been keeping them since the mid 90s. Um, so old, I'm forgetting what I'm saying now. Um, but yeah, the um, the bioactive setups say it. They are uh, hygienic, they can work if you do the spot cleaning, is all I'm trying to say, really. Um, but if you combine those with high humidity, it can be a disaster. And I see all kinds of excuses made for this, like I saw a guy, a, a reasonably popular YouTuber the other day, saying, oh, my ball python's got scale rot, but it's no big deal. Uh, it's just because the weather's been really stormy here and a bit humid, and the humidity's got high and it's got scale rot. But that's, that's not normal. Okay, it's never normal for an animal to get scale rot. So uh, what I would say about that in relation to humidity is keep the humidity in the set range and keep the ventilation good. Now, the other health concern with high humidity that also gets mentioned is uh, respiratory infections, so RIs. And RIs, I'd, I'd say again, it is true that an RI can be um, caused in part by high humidity when you combine it with very poor hygiene and perhaps poor temperatures for example um, but it's also true to say that very low humidity helps provoke our eyes and a lot not a lot of people know that and not a lot of people seem to be 
um, talking about it, but it is important to know that as well because snakes' lungs are um, delicate. They're, they're mucous membranes which facilitate gas exchange, in, in which respect they're similar to our lungs, um, except for uh, most snakes only have one lung, whereas pythons have one long lung and one very reduced lung, so they're quite vulnerable. If they get an infection, it's, it's quite serious quite quickly. But low humidity can actually degrade and dry out the mucous membranes of their lungs, and when that happens, the uh, bacteria, virus, whatever other pathogens, um, have a, an easier time getting through that barrier and causing an infection. And that is why, yes, high humidity can cause respiratory infections, but also low humidity can do a lot to cause respiratory infections as well. Um, so that is, you know, just just another good reason to keep a good eye on your humidity. So, as I said, we know what the humidity should be for ball pythons, and we also know that a lot of people like to compare their captive setup, they like to do their homework and compare their captive setup to the humidity levels in the wild that ball pythons encounter. And ball pythons live across a massive range in Africa, um, you know, all the way from literally, you know, Senegal perhaps, all the way almost right over to Sudan. It's just a massive range that stretches across part of Africa and the humidity ranges within that range are very massively, massively. So there's areas within their range where the humidity levels are regularly above 80% and there are regularly areas within their range also where the humidity levels go below 50%. So why do we want to keep it in a set range instead of, you know, having it at one of these ranges that they interact with naturally in the wild anyway. So the first thing to remember is that in very high humidity areas, even if the humidity is very very high, the ventilation is also very very high because it's open air and it's extremely hard for us to mimic high ventilation without drying things out in a captive setup. It's just It just doesn't work. Um, so that is kind of why they're able to, to tolerate high humidity in some areas in the wild. Because even though the humidity is high, the humidity of everything, the substrate, everything else is high, there's still that ventilation, that natural open airness that, you know, really, we can't really replicate in captivity. On the other end of the scale, when you see that there's areas within their range where the humidity is much lower, um, this is, I'm not sure how to talk about this to make a good example. Basically, they, they often hide in rodent burrows and other refugia. They go down below ground, um, usually after eating the rodents, so the rodents get a crap deal. Um, and in drier areas where the, the ambient humidity is lower, the ball python will just spend more uh, most of its day hiding underground, um, a good two or three feet, maybe below the surface, where the ambient humidity is naturally higher. And that is a good explanation of why um, in savanna habitats, for example, grasses naturally have longer, deeper roots that go further down into the soil than they do in humid areas. It's a natural adaptation. So plants seek deeper roots to get more hydration and higher humidity levels within the substrate. And that's just exactly what reptiles will do under the same situation. So whatever the bull pythons encounter, they take their own natural kind of steps to attenuate, um, you know, excessively low humidity. Or they naturally have kind of a less disease risk through exceptionally high humidity because of the natural circumstances. So that's, that's kind of a, a long-winded explanation of why it's best to keep their humidity in captivity in this nice range, this nice middle range. Um, we don't want to give them extremes in any way because we don't have you know, two or three foot burrows underground in most of our captive setups. Um, it's very hard to replicate a whole natural ecosystem, um, which is why, again, some of the more naturalistic enclosures are more difficult to maintain. Um, like I mentioned about the bioactive enclosures, which actually I've got nothing against bioactive enclosures. All I, all I try and nag people about is to spot clean them, you know, because that's, it's just something you have to do with bigger, bigger animals. So I've got a whole list of other things to talk about as well here, um, which I'm going to try and get through before the phone runs out of battery. <laughs> so 
now that we've kind of discussed, you know, why why the humidity needs to be where it is, um, I wanted to look at some tips for maintaining humidity in a captive setup. Now, the first and easiest tip, which is painfully obvious, is getting a spray bottle and spraying the enclosure, you know, every day if need be, or every other day. And obviously what you need to do is um, monitor the humidity. You can use an analog humidity gauge or a digital humidity gauge where you've got a probe and it's, it's just like a digital thermometer. A lot of people tell you, oh, actually don't use the analog ones because they're not very accurate. And it is true that the digital ones are more accurate than the analog ones. But what I've got to tell you as well is that the digital ones that are really, really accurate cost hundreds of dollars. They're very expensive. The average run-of-the-mill ones that you buy from Exoterra or Zilla or wherever, they're not super accurate. So really you can get away with using an analog one and just remembering to read it. If it's in the high area, you know, you know it's going to be okay. So that's kind of a non-argument. It's really what your budget can afford and, and what you prefer. All I can say is that the digital ones are slightly better. But anyway, you use your hygrometer probe or your hygrometer, your analog, you place it away from the heat source, near to substrate level, but towards the air or in the air a bit, if you possibly can. Um, and then you monitor your humidity levels, spray every day as needed, and that is a good, a good first step. Obviously, I've done a whole video on substrate. Choosing a substrate that maintains humidity is a good idea as well. And choosing an enclosure that makes, maintains humidity. But again, I talk about both of those in the substrate video, so check that out. Um, another one that is quite good is to increase the size of the water bowl or add a second water bowl. Because, you know, quite simply, the more water in the environment, even if it's standing water, the more humidity naturally evaporates off of it and enters the air. So that's quite an easy step as well, um, depending on how cluttered the environment is. You always want a ball pipe and enclosure to be cluttered, but if you can add a second water bowl, that's a pretty easy step. Another one involving water bowls is putting the water bowl, or one of them at least, um, onto a heat source or near a heat source. That can also increase evaporation, increase the ambient humidity, just remember that you mustn't make it so that it's hard for the snake to get to the heat source. So this is kind of a, a tricky one to work out, but if you can have the water bowl kind of half near the heat source or half on the heat mat, for example, um, that, that can definitely help. Just remember that the snake has priority. After that, this is this is quite a quite a good one. I don't think a lot of people really mention it in their videos, but Getting hiding places, so caves or hide boxes or whatever, with smooth surfaces and narrow entrances. So I'm going to try and juggle coral and the exoterra cave I've got here at the same time. So basically, this this one isn't ready to use yet because I need to burnish some some rough edges off it still. But basically, these are resin, and the inside surface is quite smooth. The smoother a surface is, the less porous it is. Basically. Um, and that means that when the snake hides under it, as the snake breathes, the moisture from its breath condensates onto a nice smooth surface and it tends to create a kind of a, a humid layer, not quite droplets, but it definitely creates a moist layer on the inside of the hide. And that's, that's, that narrow entrance helps maintain that again because there's no air circulation within the hide. And that almost creates some little like a humid microclimate and that actually does help with their their humidity where they are sitting and where they're laying at all times. I mean the plastic ones are really smooth and that works really well but again they're a bit lighter so some of the adults don't like the plastic ones as much as the as the heavier resin ones. But that's that's always a good step. You know a heavy resin hide with smooth inside surfaces will help your snake shed even if it's not strictly speaking a humid hide. Now, another one that I think a lot of people in the States probably know about, um, because glass tanks are still very popular over there. Um, they're still popular here too, but uh, I think people in the States have been using them for a long time. Uh, another measure is to reduce the ventilation in your enclosure, particularly if you have an enclosure with a mesh top. If you cover 
I want to say two thirds or three quarters of that mesh top with something, with some kind of plastic or something, that is going to reduce ventilation. And whenever you reduce ventilation, um, you're going to increase humidity levels. Now, obviously, you don't want ventilation to be so low that it's unhygienic. You don't want stagnant air. But reducing ventilation is a good measure and it does work. Uh, likewise, I mean, if you've got humidity that's too high, you can put a few more holes in whatever enclosure you've got, add a vent, for example, or put holes in a plastic tub if you use those, and that can help reduce um, humidity. So ventilation goes both ways, and it's, it's an important fact to think about. So I hope these, hope these tips are reasonably useful. They're really just things I've been doing over the years to basically get sheds to feel good. So also I wanted to say, just before we move on to the last point, um, well, aside from, I guess, using hygrometers, like I said, the analog or digital ones, it's really good to get into the habit of picking your snake up and feeling if it feels humid. Now, it sounds kind of weird, but basically, if you pick up Coral, she's in good humidity right now. She feels very smooth. She feels like leather, basically. And what you'll notice is with a snake that's in high, well, sorry, low humidity, um, You'll pick them up and you run your finger along the belly and the edges of the scales are starting to come up. You're starting to feel these little rough bits and it, it almost feels like a crispiness, like a dryness. And you feel the edges of the scales as you run your finger up. And that is, I mean, that's almost as good an indicator as any hygrometer that your humidity is too low. And what you'll see eventually, obviously you can't see it on her, um, is on these, these central ventral scales here you will eventually see tiny little cracks and flakes occurring. And if, if you've got that going on, I mean, you're, you know, you're in for a bad shed next time around. Um, but it is a good, it's a good thing to kind of learn and think about as well. Um, you know, as most people handle their snakes regularly, picking them up and handling them is a good way. She's actually been quite well behaved for this video. She's usually a bit more wriggly than this. Um, so I'm pleased with that. So last, but not least, sorry about the chair squeaking as it always does when I do these videos. I just wanted to cover making humid hides for ball pythons. Now, making humid hides for ball pythons it does work. There's lots of people do it successfully. Um, there's a few ways you can do it. You can make a plastic box or a plastic container with a hole in the top or the side filled with sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss is excellent at maintaining humidity. It stays damp for ages. Um, and it's also very clean, it's very safe, it's very natural. Or you can get an exoterra hide like I've got there, uh, and you can put you know a lot of wet moss under that the day before your snake sheds, for example, once the eyes have stopped being blue and turned clear. Um, but there is a lot of people also who say to me, well, I've made a, a humid hide and my ball python won't go in it. And there is a reason for that, uh, and that is that Bull pythons really hate bumping their nose into stuff and touching their nose on stuff. So if you make your humid hide with sphagnum moss right up to the edge, your bull python won't go in because it will try to go in, it will bump its nose on it and it will think I'm just not going to do this. They don't, some of them like to play at borrowing through their loose substrate but often they just don't bother. So you really need to, if you make a humid hide, make sure the entrance to the hide is clear and that some area behind it is clear or that it's almost like the snake can go in and sit on top of the moss or the moss is around the sides if you see what i mean but whatever however you work it you need to make sure that entrance is clear and it will make your ball python much much more likely to go in and use the hide so they can work for ball pythons just just bear in mind that some of them are put off by an entrance that feels even partially blocked they won't they won't push it so as always i hope this video has been helpful i think she's running out of patience it's warm enough in here but she is running out of patience um as always uh, as i always say please do like and subscribe please do comment i've noticed there's a few people that comment on almost every video that regularly comment and a lot of you are putting in really interesting information useful information i think you are actually adding to the videos for other people so please do continue and please do you know spread the knowledge and um you know let everyone have access because that's that's kind of what this channel is about just just giving out the knowledge and hoping it spreads and hopes it 
hoping it starts conversations. So hopefully I'll see you again for another video next week. Thank you very much.